We live in an unprecedented time, and many of us have struggled in the recent days and weeks to figure out how to celebrate Easter and the resurrection of Jesus in these unprecedented times. All of the typical celebrations have been put on hold. The gatherings, the worship services, the meals have been put on hold. Everything we typically expect about Easter is different this year. It almost doesn't even feel like Easter. It's different because we feel the weight of the darkness that weighs on the world right now. Countries all over the globe are shut down. And the world, the whole world, lives with the pain of fear, the pain of anxiety, and the fear of death. The fear of ruin. The fear of not knowing normal. Now despite this unusual time, we are not the first to experience deep darkness. Throughout the Gospel of John, readers are invited to wrestle with and reckon with the reality of global darkness. And it's important that we get that information, that, that invitation, because sometimes it's easy to ignore the reality of global darkness. We can shift into our bubbles. We can live our lives of relative ease and comfort. Yes, there are disruptions at times, but by and large, many of us live in generally comfortable lives. And sometimes it takes a crisis to be reminded that the world is a place that is still racked with darkness. John understands that when he writes his gospel. And he invites his readers to reckon with that reality. From the beginning of the gospel of John, we are reminded that Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. As the narrative continues, we find uh, Nicodemus coming to ask Jesus some questions, but he doesn't come in the daylight. He comes under the cover of darkness. And as the narrative continues, the darkness in the hearts of the people around Jesus becomes clear and unmistakable as they plot His death. And perhaps we've considered over the weekend the deep darkness of that previously unused tomb in which Jesus' body laid on Holy Saturday. The Gospel of John insists to us, do not ignore the reality of the darkness. The good news, brothers and sisters, is that the darkness has not overcome the power of God revealed in Jesus. The good news is that the darkness has not overcome the power of God revealed in Jesus. And not only has the darkness not overcome Jesus, Jesus takes 
that palpable darkness and transforms it into an opportunity for our transformation, for our healing, for the healing of the nations, for ministry, for mission, and for victory. That's the bottom line in John chapter 20. Resurrection transforms our greatest darkness into God's greatest victory. Resurrection transforms our darkest night into God's greatest victory. Once again, the theme of darkness shows up in the first verse of John chapter 20. You would have thought we could have put that behind us by now. After all, this is the resurrection passage. Shouldn't we be talking about the light and the glory and the sun coming up and and all of these things? And yet John says in chapter 20, verse 1, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. It's the first thing we hear. The sun has not come up yet. The world remains in darkness. And Mary has gone to the tomb. When she gets to the tomb, she discovers that the stone has been rolled away. Her first thought is that someone has stolen the body. She doesn't go immediately to resurrection. No one was really expecting that. No one was expecting that. We're told in just a few minutes that they haven't yet come to understand that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. He's told them. He's predicted it. He said when He cleansed the temple in John's Gospel, He says, tear the temple down and I'll raise it up in three days. And everybody's saying, what in the world is He talking about? It's taken a long time to build this temple. And then the disciples realized later He was talking about His body. He was talking about the resurrection. But things didn't come clear until after they met the resurrected Jesus. And so Mary comes up. The stone is rolled away. She doesn't go in. Her first thought is, grave robbers. Someone has taken the body. And so she runs back to tell Peter and the other disciple. The one, we are told, whom Jesus loved. She tells them that they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid Him. So Peter and this other disciple, the one Jesus loved, take off. We never get His name. We just get this, the one Jesus loved. They take off. Peter is apparently a little bit quicker. No, excuse me, that's the other way around. Peter was behind. The disciple Jesus loved was a little bit quicker. He gets there first, but he doesn't go in. Peter, with all of his brashness that we've come to expect from him, catches up, blazes right past the guy and goes in. And when they do, they discover that the linen wrappings that Jesus' body was wrapped in are lying there. Now this is important, because the last time we observed linen wrappings around a dead body, they were wrapped around Lazarus, when Jesus brought him out of the grave, raised him from the dead. You'll remember, though, that Lazarus stepped out of the tomb wearing his linen wrappings. He was still wrapped up. Jesus had to say, loose him, let him go, get that stuff off of him. The fact that the grave clothes are laying in the tomb tells us, hey, this ain't quite the same thing that happened with Lazarus. Lazarus was raised to die again. Jesus has left the trappings of the tomb behind him. The grave clothes are left behind. He doesn't need anyone to unwrap him. He is the Lord of life. Now, the New Testament scholars debate who the beloved disciple is. Many think, probably most, that it's John himself. That's kind of the typical reading. A couple of folks think the beloved disciple is Lazarus. Because the last time we hear someone Jesus loved, it's talking about Lazarus earlier in the Gospel. 
It's difficult to decide which one is right. But imagine for a moment if this is Lazarus walking up to Jesus' empty tomb. Who just a short time before had walked out of his own tomb. Wrapped in grave clothes. Imagine what it would be like for him to see Jesus' grave clothes still there. Consider the contrast. Consider the weightiness. Consider the emotion. Then the other disciples. When they see the clothes still lying behind, then we are told he saw and believed. And this is the thing John is after, isn't it? In the writing of the gospel, before it's over, he says, I'm writing these things down so that you will know that Jesus is Messiah and, and believe in him and trust him and surrender yourself to him. And here in this moment, for the first time, things are becoming clear. It hadn't been clear up until this point. That's what the next line means. As yet, they did not understand the Scripture that He must rise from the dead. But here, Lazarus, or the, the beloved disciple, John Lazarus, whoever it is, is beginning to believe. It's, it's coming clear. The fog is clearing. Revelation is happening. And he is realizing the power of God. The truth that we've heard earlier in the Gospel. In Jesus is life. And he is undergoing that transformation from the darkest night he's ever experienced. From Friday afternoon when Jesus' dead body was taken down from the cross to Saturday when the darkness of the tomb surrounded him to that dark morning before the sun came up. He is experiencing the transformation from darkest night to greatest victory. He believed. The story continues. Peter and the beloved disciple return to their homes. They don't appear to have the full thing going on, do they? It's not clear that they really have zeroed in, even if they're beginning to understand what's going on. Mary remained. She stood outside the tomb weeping. And then she saw two angels sitting in white, signifying with their presence that God was at work. One was sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, the other at the, uh, one at the head, the other at the feet. They were both where the body had been. They ask her, why are you weeping? She responds, they've taken away my Lord. Mary is still in this grave robber's mentality. She has not come to see it yet. She is looking for Jesus, but she's not looking for the living Jesus. She's looking for the dead body of Jesus. They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid Him. When she said this, she turns around and Jesus is standing right there, but she still doesn't recognize Him. Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? She thinks He's the gardener. She still doesn't see Him. If you know where they've laid His body, let me know. I'll go get it. I'll put it back. I'll make sure He's honored. You can just feel the pain that she's experienced. This dark night and dark morning of her soul. You can feel the pain and the weightiness and the grief. And that grief is compounded by insult. Because the body's been stolen, she thinks. And she's restlessly looking around this, this, this garden. Looking for Jesus' dead body. And she's looking so hard for Jesus, she doesn't see Him standing right in front of her. And I wonder how many of us do that. Maybe you've had that experience where the, just the vitality isn't there. You've gone through just a season of spiritual dryness. 
You haven't given up on church. You still read your Bible. You try to pray, but maybe those prayers feel strained. Maybe it feels like they just don't make it past the ceiling. You struggle. You're looking for Jesus. You want Him to show up and fill you with life. And, but something's missing. She looked for Jesus so hard, she didn't see him standing right in front of her. And then, the crucial thing happens. He calls her name, Mary. And when that voice falls on her ears, her eyes are open. And she beholds for the first time the risen Lord. And it's a helpful reminder. It's an essential reminder. We cannot control Jesus. We cannot manipulate him into showing up. He is the Lord. We are not. And I don't understand why he decides to reveal himself at one time and not another. But it is absolutely and crucially clear that the initiative in the new phase of their relationship lies with Jesus, not Mary. We need Him to call our names. And I wonder whose name He's calling today. Maybe it's your name. Maybe you've been searching for Him. Maybe you've been praying. Maybe you've been longing and you feel stuck. Perhaps on this Easter Sunday, 2020, the risen Lord Jesus Christ is calling your name. That makes all the difference in the world. And it is a demonstration of how the resurrection of Jesus transforms our darkest night into God's greatest victory. Mary experienced that in the garden that morning as the sun was beginning to rise. The resurrected Lord transformed her darkness and her brokenness and her weeping and her sorrow into joy and gladness and hope. She cries out, Teacher, Rabbi, words that had come from her lip so many times, undoubtedly, but this time with new energy and hope. Jesus tells her, Do not hold on to me, because I've not yet ascended to the Father. And this is a a strange thing to say, isn't it? You would almost expect Jesus to just kind of open arms and embrace her and respond to her responding with, with this, this rich embrace and just this, this deep love. But what does He do? He says, hang on. And He signals to her in that moment that their relationship is entering into a new phase, a new experience of reality. Things are not going to be the same after this. He says, don't hold on to me. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way somewhere. I've moved from the depth of the grave, and now I'm here with you, and I will continue to be with you for some time, but I'm on my way to ascend to the Father. 
And the thing that we need to see is that Jesus ascends to the Father. He's not accessible to Mary to just go and lay hands on Him, but He has become universally accessible to all of us because He has made us a part of His family. The family of His Father. This is the thing that's going on here. Don't hold on to me. Things are changing. I'm ascending to my Father. So go tell my brothers. Notice the family language. Go tell my, fa- my brothers, Peter, John, all of the others, go and tell them that I'm ascending to my Father. And not just my Father, your Father. Tell my brothers, I'm going to our Father. My God and your God. And we are meant to discover that there's a new relationship with God through Jesus that is available because of the resurrection. If we go all the way back to chapter 1, remember, if you want to get what's going on in John's Gospel, you need to immerse yourself in the first 18 verses. John chapter 1, just the first chapter, just dig in. Because Jesus, we are there told, is the only one who's ever seen God. God the Son, who is deeply and intimately connected to the Father, who is close to the Father's heart, who is one with the Father. God the Son, the only one born of God, He is making the Father known. And to those who believe in who? Jesus, the only Son. To those who believe in Jesus, He gives the power to become children of God, sons of God. And now, that is, anticipation is realized. Before the resurrection, Peter didn't have the power to become a son of God. Now Jesus says, you go tell Peter and the others, I'm going to my father and your father. You are now my brothers. It's a new way of relating to Jesus. He's not just walking around Galilee. You don't have to go find out where He is physically. To be near Him. Yes, He still is a physical human being reigning at the right hand of God the Father, but through His Spirit, He is universally accessible. Because He has ascended, He is universally accessible. And His presence in that, He brings people into His presence. And He wants To bring you, wherever you are, into His presence. And into the presence of His Father. And He wants to say to you, You are my brother. You are my sister. Come. Come to the Father. So many people... feel so far from God. And the crisis that we are in in the moment amplifies that. People say, where is God in this? And the answer is, He's in Jesus. And He's not a stranger to our pain. He's not a stranger to our suffering. And he has scars on his body to prove it. And for the joy said before him of bringing the lost sheep home, of bringing the scattered family back to the Father, he endured the sufferings of the cross. For the joy of being able to say, My Father, and your Father. My God, and your God. None of us have the opportunity that Mary had to actually lay our hands on Jesus' body, or that Thomas will have later in the narrative, to actually touch the marks. But that doesn't mean he's far away. The ascended Lord Jesus is universally accessible. 
and he is at work to bring about his new creation. That's what he is doing right now. John wants us to understand that, that this is a new creation story. He drops clue after clue after clue that we are talking about new creation. I told you back in chapter 1, Jesus is the, the power of God, the Word of God. God speaks and brings the world, the universe, everything that exists, He speaks and brings it into existence. And Jesus is the agent in that power. Jesus is the agent accomplishing that creative power. And now, the one who spoke the world into existence in the first place is now bringing it into new existence, into a new creation. And John drops these hints everywhere. The first one comes with that first day of the week thing. And then in a few minutes, he's going to mention the evening on the first day of the week. And we might think, well, what, I mean, what is, that? What, what, what is that supposed to tell us? Morning, evening, evening, morning. But doesn't that sound a great deal like Genesis chapter 1? There was evening and morning the first day, evening, morning the second day, evening, morning the third day. And yeah, it could just be a coincidence until we're told that Jesus is a gardener, or Mary thinks he is. And then again, that Genesis story comes to the, the creation narrative, comes to its climax when God puts his human beings in a garden place of his presence and Mary thinks Jesus mistakenly is just kind of the guy tending the garden but in reality he is the gardener cultivating the new creation and this first day of the week day one of new creation when Jesus comes out of the tomb The significance of that is amplified if we count backwards a little bit. You take one day backwards, you're on Saturday, the Sabbath. You take one more day backwards, you're on Friday, the sixth day of the previous week. Track with me here. Where Jesus does the work of atonement. Where He is faithful. He is the faithful human being. They threaten Him, they accuse Him falsely, and He offers Himself for us. And in John 19.6, we hear Pilate say, Here is the man. And those words mean more than Pilate ever knew. On the sixth day, God created man and woman. And on the sixth day, Jesus redeemed us. As the true human being, who was faithful to God's calling, who was faithful to His Father's vocation, who has finished there on the sixth day the work of redemption. It is finished. And it required His life. And so they took His body down and they laid it in a tomb on the Sabbath day all day long. In the darkness of the tomb, God rested from His work of redemption in Jesus. But on Sunday, the first day of God's new week, day one, Jesus is back to work. He laid around all day the day before, didn't He? But now... He is on His way to the Father. And He is transforming the greatest night of darkness into God's greatest victory. We need to be clear on what the resurrection is. The resurrection of Jesus involves the same body that was crucified being brought to new life. And this new life is a life that cannot die again. It is a life that is not subject to sin or death. 
The contrast with Lazarus we mentioned earlier is helpful. Lazarus died again. I haven't seen him around. I don't think you have either. Jesus doesn't die again. He's alive and he reigns and he is presently reigning at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and interceding for all of us, working his new creation in us and in the world through his brothers and his sisters who have this transformed experience so that everyone in the world has access to the resurrected and exalted Lord Jesus. Imagine the movement from darkest night to the victory of God for Jesus. Imagine what the tomb was like before Peter and the other disciple got there, before the stone was rolled away. Imagine if you could be there in the tomb, in the darkness, just before Jesus was raised. And maybe you're in a corner and you can see a little bit because your eyes have grown accustomed and the body is there on the table in the middle of the room and it's wrapped in the grave clothes and all of a sudden you think you see, but you can't have actually seen it because you saw him die. You think you see his chest begin to rise and fall. As his lungs fill with air the first time since Friday. And his heart beats for the first time since Friday. And the blood that was shed to purchase our redemption once again begins to pulse through the arteries and the veins and the capillaries. And the grave releases the Lord. Darkness transforms into victory. And that's the victory that the disciples needed to experience when they were cowering in the dark of the evening in a room, afraid of those who had crucified Jesus, that those who had crucified Jesus would come after them too. That's what they feared. It was evening that day, verse 19, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked because they were afraid of the Jews, because after all, they went after their leader. Surely they'd round up all of those who were associated with him and just make sure this movement was over. And Jesus came and stood among them. So he's got this new body, but locked doors apparently don't, are not a problem. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not a physical body. It means there's new rules for resurrected bodies. He says to them first, peace be with you. He, in the place of fear, he brings the word of peace. And after this, he shows them his hands inside. Because John wants us to know again, this isn't a ghost. It's not some kind of spiritual apparition. This is a real person, a human being, with hands and feet and scars. And blood. And lungs. And a brain. He's real. He's tangible. He's, you can touch him. Jesus said to them again, as they rejoice at the sight of him, peace be with you. And here's the key piece. We talk about the transformation that Jesus offers. We talk about how he brings us from darkness to victory. We cannot forget what he says to the disciples. Listen to this. Again, you need to have Genesis in the back of your mind. He breathes on them. How does God create Adam? He forms him out of the dust of the ground and breathes the breath of life onto him. Time after time again, John catches Genesis 1 and brings it forward. He mentions the creation narrative and brings it into the new creation narrative. Jesus is working new creation, transformation in the disciples in this moment in a locked room on the evening of His resurrection. He breathes on them and makes them new. He breathes on them and regenerates them. He breathes on them and brings them to life. But He does not leave them where they are. He sends them on a mission. He commissions them. And what does He say? Receive the Holy Spirit. I promised you the Holy Spirit a few chapters ago. Now receive the Holy Spirit. 
And here's what that means. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And we think, what in the world does that mean? What Jesus is doing is commissioning his church to take the gospel to the world. And the gospel means declaring the reality of human rebellion and sin. The gospel means Jesus died because we're rebels. Jesus died because we have gone over to the darkness. Jesus died because our hearts are estranged from Him and far from Him and we are His enemies. Thanks be to God He doesn't regard His enemies as enemies. He comes to us. And He calls us to go and declare the good news that despite your sin and darkness, your sin can be forgiven. You declare the reality of sin and you declare the glory and beauty of redemption. You go tell the world, Jesus is saying, you go tell the world that resurrection means your darkest night can, be God's, can become God's greatest victory. You go tell the world. They can't stay in that locked room. They can't stay in that place of fear. And that makes me wonder... What is it? And I don't know that we're going to know right away, but we need to be seeking, we need to be praying, we need to be asking the Lord, what is it that you want to do in this dark time? How do you want to bring the victory of God to the globe in the midst of this dark time? People are dying. People are hurting. People are afraid. I think there's a clue. When the disciples see the resurrected Jesus, they rejoice. What does it look like for the church? Still Still in the room. To rejoice at the grace that comes with the resurrection of Jesus. Our message this Easter, in this season of separation and isolation and death, our message is that there is no dark pit too deep for God's grace and light and life and love to reach. There is no darkness too deep and no pit too dark for God's Grace to penetrate. And so I invite you to be looking for the place in your life where you need to experience His His transformative resurrection power. And be looking for the places in your community and in your family and in the church and in the, in the, the state, the country, the world. How do we joyfully minister the victory of God in Jesus to the world Jesus died to save in this very, very dark time. Resurrection means that the darkest night becomes God's greatest victory.